Welcome to the Ultimate Sports Podcast. Today is Thursday, April 11th, 2019. Today I'm going to recap last night's Stanley Cup playoff games, look ahead to tonight's games, go over the last night of the NBA regular season, look ahead to the playoff matchups. And by the way, I'm going to do a separate podcast doing my NBA playoff predictions. It's either going to go up sometime tonight or tomorrow. Baseball, NFL mock draft, Black Thursday in the NBA where coaches are getting fired. We have one down, probably more to go, and then my best bet of the day. All right, Stanley Cup playoffs. Some very interesting results from last night. Some shockers, some not-so-shockers. We'll start with the most surprising result from last night. Now it's the Blue Jackets defeating the Lightning 4-3 to in Game 1. Columbus takes a one nothing series lead. I did not have Columbus winning a game in the series, let alone winning Game 1. Tampa jumped out to a 3 nothing lead early. Alex Kalorn scored shorthanded to make it one nothing. Anthony Sorelli scored to make it 2 nothing. Yanni Goudreau scored to make it 3 nothing. Second period, Nick Felicno scored to make it a 3-1 game. Third period, David Savard made it a one-goal game. Josh Anderson ties it 3-3 shorthanded. And then Seth Jones on the power play gave Columbus a 4-3 lead. So Columbus was the better team on special teams, although Tampa had a shorthanded goal. Number one started the game with a goal, Seth Jones. Number two started the game with a goal, Anthony Sorelli. Number three started the game with a goal and assist, Josh Anderson. Islanders over the Penguins 4-3 in overtime as they take a 1-0 lead. Great crowd at the Coliseum last night. A minute 40 into the game, Josh Aberly scored to make it one off in Isles. Phil Kessel ties it up at one apiece. Brock Nelson on the power play makes it 2-1. Second period, Evgeny Malkin on the power play makes it 2-2. Third period, Nick Letty scores the go-ahead goal to make it 3-2. Justin Schultz ties it up 3-3 in an overtime. Josh Bailey with the winner. And he was the number one star of the game with that overtime goal. Number two star of the game with a goal and assist, Jordan Eberle. Number three star of the game with a goal, Nick Letty. Blues over the Jets 2-1 to one, and St. Louis takes a 1-0 series. So that's a big win for St. Louis to steal game one on the road. As the Jets actually got the scoring first. Patrick Lane scores 1-0 Jets. Scoreless second, third period. Here come the Blues. David Perron ties it up at one apiece. And then Tyler Bozak. Scores the game-winning goal with about two minutes to go. Maybe it was three minutes to go by then to make it a 2-1 lead for St. Louis as they hang on. Jordan Binghamton was great. And so was Connor Hellebuck until the third period. But good for the Blues taking game one. Stars over the Predators 3-2 to as they steal game one on the road to take a 1-0 series lead. The first goal of the game actually went to Nashville's Roman Yossi to put the Preds on top 1-0. Second period, Miro Hiskinen on the power play ties it up at one apiece. Third period, Hiskinen again, 2-1 stars. Matsukarello scores his first playoff goal as a member of the Dallas Stars, 3-1 stars. Then P.K. Subban scores to make it 3-2, and that was your final Number one star of the game with two goals was Miro Hiskinen. Number two star of the game with a goal, Matsu Garel. Number three star of the game with 30 saves on 32 shots, Ben Bishop. Sharks over to Golden Knights, 5-2. to two. Good win for San Jose on home ice to get things started. First period, Joe Pavelski on the power play, 1-0 Sharks. Second period, Brent Burns, 2-0 Sharks. Mark Edward Vlasic, 3-0 Sharks. Mark Stone to make it a 3-1 game. Evander Kane makes it 4-1. Third period, Mark Stone again on the power play makes it a 4-2 game. Thomas Hurdle with the dagger goal to make it a 5-2 final for San Jose. Number one start of the game with a goal and assist, Brent Burns. Number two start of the game with two assists, Eric Carlson. Number three start of the game with a goal, Joe Pavelski. So that is a great win for San Jose. Three games tonight, 7 o'clock on NBCSN. You have the Maple Leafs and the Bruins. Boston is favored in the game. I took Boston in seven to win the series. I think Boston takes care of business in game one on home ice. And they'll win this game. Let's go four to three in regulation. 7.30 on the USA Network, the Hurricanes and the Capitals. You have the Hurricanes in the playoffs for the first time since 2009. Capitals trying to um, repeat. I took the Capitals in six, and I think they'll take care of business on home ice. Let's say 4-2 is the final there. 
10 o'clock NBCSM, the Avalanche and the Flames. I think this is going to be a sneaky good series for a 1-8, essentially. And I actually think the Flames are going to take game one, 5-4 in overtime. Let's say Johnny Gaudreau with the winner. So these three games are all interesting, and I'm looking forward to them. Now up the NBA. Going to go over the results from last night. Pistons over the Knicks, 115-89, as they get the final playoff spot in the Eastern Conference. Blake Griffin didn't play. He should be ready for the playoffs. Detroit finishes at 41-41. and Knicks finish at 17-65. and Luke Kennard had 27 points to lead the Pistons, and John Jenkins had 16 to lead New York. Pacers over the Hawks, 135-134. Meaningless game. The Hawks, I think, tried to lose. to get better ping-pong balls. Indiana's 48-34. Atlanta finishes at 29-53. TJ Leaf led Indiana in scoring with 28 points. Trey Young had 23 for the Hawks. Nets over the Heat, 113-94. Big story here, Dwayne Wade's final game. As Miami finishes at a disappointing 39-43. Brooklyn's 42-40. Wade had a triple-double in his final game. 25 points, 10 assists, and 11 rebounds. So that's sensational. LeBron James, Chris Paul, Carmelo Anthony all in attendance. And D'Angelo Russell at 21 for Brooklyn. Magic over the Hornets, 122-114. to Orlando finishes 42-40. and Charlotte, 39-43. So Charlotte is playing in a meaningful game in game um, 82. So that, I guess, is means something, but they don't make the playoffs, which makes it a little disappointing. Next up, the 76ers over the Bulls, 125 to 109. Philly, 51 and 31. Chicago, 22 and 60. Walt Lehman Jr. had 20 for Chicago. Jonathan Simmons had 20 for Philly. Grizzlies over the Warriors, 132 to 117. I thought that Memphis was going to be competitive, but not win because they're tanking. 33 and 49. They finish at Golden State finishes at 57 and 25. Thunder over the Bucks, 127 and 116. OKC 49-33, Milwaukee 60-22. and Spurs over the Mavs 105-94, Dirk Nowitzki's final game. He had 20-10. and Dallas finishes the year 33-49, San Antonio 48-34. Nuggets over the Timberwolves 99-95. Denver had the big comeback. They finished 54-28 of the regular season in Minnesota 36-46. Clippers over the Jazz 143-137 in overtime. As these two teams knew their fates in terms of they're seeding at the time. Clippers finish at 48 and 34. Utah finished at 50 and 32. Route Flowers final regular season game at the Staples Center was the big story there. And the Trailblazers over to Kings 136, 131. Portland was down 33 and it came from behind and won. Portland's 53 and 29. Sacramento is 39 and 43. The playoff matchups are set. You have in the East, Milwaukee and Detroit. Toronto and Orlando, Philly and Brooklyn, Boston, Indiana, and in the West you have Golden State and the Clippers, Denver and San Antonio, Portland and Oklahoma City, and Houston and Utah. Now I'm going to quickly do baseball. Just going to go through last night's results and then look ahead to today's games. No game details or anything. Just got to be quick here because there's some games underway already. Reds over the Marlins 2 to 1, Athletics over the Orioles 10 to 3, Nats over the Phillies 15 to 1, Mets over the Twins 9 to 6, Astros over the Yankees 8 to 6, Cards over the Dodgers 7 to 2, Pirates over the Cubs 5 to 2, Mariners over the Royals 6 to 5, Rangers over the Diamondbacks 5 to 2, Angels over the Brewers 4 to 2, Tigers over the Indians 4 to 1, Rays over the White Sox 9 to 1 and Padres over the Giants 3 to 1. Underway already is Marlins Reds, middle of the second, and then Athletics Orioles. Orioles up 1 0. 1 o'clock Indians Tigers, 115 Dodgers Cardinals, Mariners Royals. 7 o'clock Blue Jays Red Sox. 720 Mets Braves. 8 o'clock Pirates Cubs. 940 Padres Diamondbacks. And 945 the Rockies at the Giants. Some NBA coaching news. Um. The Kings are planning to fire Dave Yeager. I can't say I'm surprised, even though the Kings overachieved this year. 
Um, I predicted Jaeger to be fired before the year, but that was because I had the Kings penciled in for the low to mid-20s for wins. I mean, said they overachieve, and their dysfunctional front office goes ahead and fires Jaeger. That's ridiculous. Do they know that somebody better is going to be available? I mean, you better hire somebody good to replace them. Like, do you know if Luke Walton's being let go by the Lakers? Do you know if, assuming Portland loses in round one to Oklahoma City, like, could potentially Terry Stotts be available? They're not getting Doc Rivers. He's not going anywhere. I think he saved his job this year. Not that they were essentially playing on fire him, but he's somebody that's certainly not getting fired. Maybe he's somebody from the East gets fired unexpectedly that we're not thinking of. Steve Clifford's not going anywhere. I think he's safe. Eric Spolster, I don't think, is losing his job with the Heat. And maybe a good college coach might be willing to take your job, but it's crazy. Dave Yeager, I think, did a great job this year. Getting 40 wins out of that team. And it's just remarkable how a team overachieves and then they fire their coach. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the same thing happened to Jaeger in Memphis when they fired him after his Grizzlies team overachieved. And then the same thing happened with his preceder in Memphis, Lionel Hollins. They make the conference finals and then they fi- go ahead and fire Lionel Hollins. In Memphis, so it's just bizarre how this league is and just sports in general. Like, like what is what do you have to do to keep his job? Win a playoff game against the Warriors? Like, come on! I really think that Jaeger got a raw deal here, and I think he got that team to overachieve. They have a nice core with Bagley, Fox, and Heald. Whoever gets that job, that job is actually attractive now. More attractive than it's been in years because of that young core. And nothing against the Marcus Cousins, but don't you think that him being out of there kind of made things a little smoother because of his personality and how he is sometimes. It was better for Boogie to move on from that franchise. He did well against Anthony Davis, or playing with Anthony Davis, I'd say, I should say. And then he moves on to Golden State, and he's having an impact there. And I think the Golden State thing is just a, a rentals thing for the Warriors. And then Boogie will move on to wherever. Like I can see the Clippers or the Lakers going after him. Or the Boston Celtics if they lose out on the Anthony Davis sweepstakes. Obviously the Knicks if they don't get Zion Williamson or Anthony Davis. Like, Boogie has options this summer and the option of him staying with the Warriors shouldn't be ruled out either. Now I'm going to give you a quick Masters update. I'm going to go through... The leaderboard right now, I'm going to go with the surprise winner of Jason Day. First place right now is Justin Harding. Second place, Corey Connors, J.B. Holmes, Lucas Bergerard, and Tommy Fleetwood are all bunched up in a second place tie with a bunch of others. Tigers in 10th and 20th, and that's big tie. We have a bunch of people in that too, including Rory McIlroy and Justin Rahm. And then in the 43rd place tie of Ricky Fowler, that's at plus one. The even is the 21st group, minus one is the Tiger group, minus two is the tie for second, and then Harding's in first with the minus three. In the Ricky Fowler group, there's a lot of other people. Zach Johnson's in that group. A couple people bunched up for 62nd place with the plus two. Two-way tie for plus three for 67th place. 69th place is a couple-way tie for with the plus four. And then some other tee times coming up. Bubba Watson, Dustin Johnson, 
Jason Day, Justin Rose, Phil Mickelson, Justin Thomas, Jordan Spieth, Brooks Kepka, all coming up later. Now I'm going to do my latest NFL mock draft. That's my 11th mock draft. And I go from 1 to 32 as I do each and every time. Some changes in here. Number one, the Arizona Cardinals, Kyler Murray, quarterback, Oklahoma. A month ago, I thought that Murray to the Cardinals was fake news after Steve Kine came out and said, Josh Rosen is our quarterback for now. Convince me that Murray is a near lock to go to Arizona and Josh Rosen is trade bait. Murray has a lot of respect from Cliff Kingsbury, and that is the obvious connection that is making the media think this is a distinct possibility. Two, San Francisco 49ers. Nick Bosa, defensive end, Ohio State. This is the dream scenario for the Niners. Getting the best player in the draft is always a win for whomever drafts the player. Bosa would be an upgrade over any of these pass rushers currently on the Niners roster, and he would have an immediate impact like Miles Garrett did a few years back with the Browns. Three, New York Jets. Josh Allen, defensive end, outside linebacker, Kentucky. Allen is the one player that was a huge riser from the summer until now. The Jets have a need for immediate impact talent and versatility on the defensive side of the ball, and Allen would be a great fit. A trade down is not out of the question either because the Jets still have other needs to address. Four, Oakland Raiders. Quinn and Williams, defensive tackle, Alabama. Williams is someone that the silver and black will gladly take, and John Gruden loves players like Williams. He's physical and can fight out tackle. I see a poor man's Aaron Donald here. It'd be a huge win for Gruden and Mike Maycock if Arizona takes Murray and or if someone trades up to two or three to take Dwayne Haskins or somebody else. Five, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Devin White, inside linebacker, LSU. White is someone that is a fast riser among defensive players in the draft. I wouldn't be shocked if Oakland picks him at four. The Bucks have a need at the linebacker position, and White is someone that is dynamic and could be a future pro bowler. Six, the New York Giants. Montez Sweat, defensive end, outside linebacker, Mississippi State. This is the first box draft where I don't have Dwayne Haskins being picked in this spot. It would be a mistake to pass on a quarterback in this draft or unless they trade for Josh Rosen. But reading the tea leaves, it looks like they'll go defense with this pick. He is very athletic and fast, and the Giants need a pass rusher after the trading of Olivier Vernon, so this pick would make some sense. Seven, the Jacksonville Jaguars. Juwan Taylor, offensive tackle, Florida. Taylor is someone that has risen after a good combine performance. He is someone that excels in the running game and would help Leonard Fournette find holes. The Jags have an already solid offensive line, but the presence of Taylor would only give it more depth and would make life better for Nick Foles. Eighth of the Detroit Lions. Rashawn Gary, defensive end, Michigan. The Lions are almost definitely going to go defense with this pick, and it wouldn't be such a bad idea to go pass rush, even with the addition of Trey Flowers. Gary is somebody who did not live up to his number one top prospect ranking he was given in high school, but maybe he finds his potential in the pros instead. Nine, Buffalo Bills. Ed Oliver, defensive tackle, Houston. Oliver was once projected the top five pick, and his stock has dropped dramatically, so there's a chance Oliver is a steal at this point. The Bills need more help on the offensive line rather than the defensive line, but the retirement of Kyle Williams opened up a hole that Oliver can facilitate. Ten, Denver Broncos. Drew Locke, quarterback, Missouri. There is some chatter that the Broncos might take or trade up for a quarterback, but I can see John Elway taking a chance here, despite other speculation that he won't take a quarterback. Joe Flacco is only under contract for one season, and Locke can learn under him. 11, Cincinnati Bengals. Devin Bush, inside linebacker, Michigan. Bush is someone whose stock is rising of late, who has first-round talent. The Bengals don't have Vontez Perfect anymore, so Anita Burns is at the position, and they are a team that can use youth on their defense. There's some speculation that they're looking to find Andy Dolan's replacement, but I'm not buying it. 12, Green Bay Packers. TJ Hawkinson, tight end, Iowa. Jimmy Graham isn't the same player he once was in New Orleans, so the Packers should snag a fast-rising tight end in Hawkinson. He's a good blocker and has drawn comparisons to George Kittle of the 49ers. It also wouldn't surprise me if they take a defensive player here. 13, Miami Dolphins. Dwayne Haskins, quarterback, Ohio State. Haskins falls to the Dolphins as they take him and change the narrative that they are tanking to take one of the A-list quarterbacks in next year's draft. Haskins is the best quarterback in this draft class, and he really has a chance to be special. 14, Atlanta Falcons. 
Christian Wilkins, defensive tackle, Clemson. Wilkins is the first of three defensive linemen to be drafted in terms of Clemson players. The Falcons did franchise tag Guardy Jarrett instead of letting him test the open market, but selecting a defensive lineman here at both their depth at that area. And Wilkins can start for Dan Quinn immediately if need be. 15, the Washington Redskins. Daniel Jones, quarterback, Duke. With Alex Smith's future uncertain, the Skins take a chance with a young quarterback in Jones. He has drawn comparisons to Eli Manning and has also participated in the Manning Passing Academy. His stock has risen with a good showing in the Senior Bowl and the Combine, and it sure seems like he's a surefire first-round pick. 16, Carolina Panthers. DK Metcalf, wide receiver, Ole Miss. The Panthers have some options here, so they settle on getting Cam Newton a new person to throw to. Metcalf is someone that has some upside and is fast, a downfield threat, and someone who has a chance to get drafted as high as seventh to the Jags. 17, New York Giants from the Cleveland Browns. Cleveland Farrell, defensive end, Clemson. The second of two Clemson players get taken here at Farrell. The Giants desperately need help on their pass rush, arguably as bad as they need their franchise quarterback. Farrell is someone who will start on day one and will give the team someone who can get to the quarterback and stop the run very well. 18, the Minnesota Vikings. Jonah Williams, offensive tackle, Alabama. The Vikings land a mega steal here with Williams, who is the best lineman in the draft. Williams will be starting right away in this scenario, and Kirk Cousins needs protection badly because his offensive line was brutal a year ago, and Cousins needs to quiet some critics with two years left on the big contract he signed last year. 19, the Tennessee Titans. Grady Williams, cornerback, LSU. What a steal this would be for the Titans. Thought out to be the best corner in the draft, Tennessee lands someone that can come in and start right away. Malcolm Butler isn't getting any younger, so this pick makes a ton of sense as they would end up with a secondary featuring Williams and Kevin Byard. 20, Pittsburgh Steelers. Byron Murphy, cornerback, Washington. Murphy falling this far would be somewhat of a steal for the Steelers. Yes, they absolutely need a wide receiver with the departure of Antonio Brown, but this wouldn't be a bad option considering their secondary isn't great either. 21, Seattle Seahawks. Deontay Thompson, safety, Alabama. Thompson would be a steal dropping this far. The Legion of Boom is gone in the Emerald City, and drafting the best safety in the draft would be great for Pete Carroll's young secondary. 22, Baltimore Ravens. Nikhil Harry, wide receiver, Arizona State. The Ravens have more needs in terms of offensive playmakers more than any team that made the playoffs last season. Harry would be a nice weapon for Lamar Jackson, who needs a down threat guy to help his development. 23, Houston Texans. Andre Dillard, offensive tackle, Washington State. No team needs an offensive line improvement in the league more than the Texans. Dillard is so unrising due to a strong combine. He is the best blocking tackle in the draft. It would be good for Deshaun Watson, who was sacked a whopping 62 times last year. 24 Oakland Raiders from the Chicago Bears. Josh Jacobs, running back, Alabama. The Raiders used their second first-round pick for a position of need with Marshawn Lynch and Doug Martin not being long-term solutions. Jacobs is the best running back in the draft. I could see Maycock and Gruden taking him here before the Eagles go on the clock. 25, the Philadelphia Eagles. Dexter Lawrence, defensive tackle, Clemson. Here's the third of three Clemson players that are expected to go in the first round, and Lawrence could wind up being the best one of the trio. He reminds me of current Eagle Fletcher Cox, and the thought of those two on the interior together is scary. 26, Indianapolis Colts. A.J. Brown, wide receiver, Ole Miss. The Colts suddenly look like a team of a contender. A defensive player is the wiser choice, but Andrew Luck needs another reliable wild other than T.Y. Hillen. I'm not sold on Devin Foote just being a reliable number two guy, and Brown is someone that was overshadowed by D.K. Metcalf in college and could thrive with Andrew Luck. 27, the Oakland Raiders from the Dallas Cowboys. Rock Yassin, cornerback, Temple. This is a major reach for the Raiders as they're looking for secondary help. Yassin is a fast riser who is very physical and someone John Gruden would really like to get his potential out of and play him alongside Gary on Conley. 28, Los Angeles Chargers. Jerry Tillery, defensive tackle, Notre Dame. The Chargers' defensive front was exposed in their playoff defeat against the Patriots and bolstering their interior would be wise. Tillery is someone whose stock has risen dramatically and is worth selecting here. 29, Kansas City Chiefs. Juan Thornhill, safety, Virginia. No contender needs more secondary help than the Chiefs. 
Thornhill is someone whose stock is rising due to a strong combine. I can see the Chiefs taking a chance here. 30, Green Bay Packers from the New Orleans Saints. Terry McLaurin, wide receiver, Ohio State. McLaurin is someone whose stock is rising. I can see the Packers snagging him here. They need someone to replace Randall Cobb, and McLaurin would fit in as their wide receiver depth is pretty darn thin now. 31, Los Angeles Rams. Jeffrey Simmons, defensive tackle, Mississippi State. Simmons' stock has dropped after he's tore his ACL, so the Rams could get a steal here if he lives up to his potential. He would be a solid fit next to Aaron Donald on that defensive line. 32, New England Patriots. Paris Campbell, wide receiver, Ohio State. The second of Dwayne Haskins' targets go off the board here. Campbell is someone with a lot of speed, and he would help Tom Brady in that offense. That's it for the mock draft. Now I'm going to do my best bet of the day, brought to you by FanDuel. Too bad there's not any NBA games, but we do have Stanley Cup playoffs and baseball to play with. We'll go with the Boston Red Sox, the Boston Bruins, the Washington Capitals, and the Calgary Flames. That's four teams, 568, wagering a dollar. With a payout of $6.69. That's it for the podcast today. I'll be back tomorrow recapping Stanley Cup playoffs. Baseball. Maybe I'll have two mock drafts tomorrow. One NBA and one NHL. We'll go over more NBA firings if there is any. Masters. And keep an eye out for my NBA playoff preview and predictions podcast. And I may have a guest or two on tomorrow to talk playoffs as well. I hope you guys have a great day, everybody.